My name is Michelle McGlone. I am the new director of Brookline Adult and Community Education. I started in January before this pandemic, and uh, it, it's, it's been really interesting starting a new job um, in the midst of uh, such a crisis, but it's been really wonderful getting to know everybody and um, putting this lecture series together for the month of September has definitely been a highlight for me. Um, we've, we've heard from a lot of great people in different industries, and tonight I'm super excited um, to have somebody who's in the forefront of um, cutting edge medicine, who's here to share um, you know, with us on some of uh, the work that he's been doing. And I have a, a very brief uh, introduction. I'll just go ahead and, and share some of his uh, biography, very accomplished um, Dr. Sakar uh, Katharasan. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce him. He is the co-founder and Chief Executive Officer of Verve Therapeutics. It serves on the company's board of directors. He is a preventative cardiologist who has made groundbreaking discoveries of cardioprotective genetic mutations, which confer resistance to cardiovascular disease. Prior to joining Verve, he served as director of the Massachusetts General Hospital Center for Genomic Medicine and was the Ofer and Shelley Nemirovsky MGH Research Scholar. Um, he also served as director of the Cardiovascular Disease Initi Initiative at the Broad Institute and was professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. His research laboratory focused on understanding the inherited basis for blood lipids and myocardial infarction and using these insights to improve preventive cardiac care. Among his scientific contributions, he has helped highlight new biological mechanisms underlying heart attack, discovered mutations that protect against heart attack risk, and developed a genetic test for personalized heart attack prevention. He was honored with the Distinguished Science Award uh, from the American Heart Association in 2017, and in the 2018, the Kurt Stern Award from the American Society of Human Genetics. In tandem with his research, his clinical focus was the primary prevention of myocardial infarction in individuals with a family history of heart attack. He graduated summa cum laude with a, a bachelor's in history from the University of Pennsylvania and received his MD from Harvard Medical School. He completed his clinical training in internal medicine and cardiology at Mass General and his postdoctoral research training in human genetics at the Framingham Heart Study and the Broad Institute. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over um, to Dr. Katharisan and um, we, we thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and thanks uh, to those who, who have joined. Um, uh, I'll jump right in. Uh, we have a small group, so we can make it quite interactive. So feel free to um, interrupt uh, me um, kind of anywhere along the way. Um, and we've left plenty of room, time for questions at the end as well. Um, and what I'm going to try to cover, let me share my screen. Um, okay. As, uh, okay, there you go. Um, so as, as Michelle mentioned, um, I'm currently leading a biotech company called Verb Therapeutics. We're based in Cambridge, Mass. Uh, we're, we're about two years into our effort to create a, a new type of medicine, a gene editing medicine uh, that, uh, for, to treat heart attacks. So imagine a one and done treatment for, for lowering cholesterol and treating heart attack. And we can get into that uh, toward the um, uh, end of the uh, discussion today. Um, and before coming into Verb, founding Verb, and um, now leading it, um, I, I um, was a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and I still have a small clinical practice at Mass General, uh, seeing cardiology patients. Um, and so uh, uh, those are my those are my roles. So what I'd like to speak to you today is about heart attack, and specifically the genetic basis of heart attack, and, and this idea of kind of reading and interpreting the genome for risk for heart attack and then leveraging that information to rewrite it now for health. Um, so my work over the years has really been built off of patients that we've seen or is seen. 
in the clinic. And so here's an example of a patient. Uh, these are the actual ambulance sheets of an individual who's 42 um, and, and presented with dizziness and profuse sweating. And uh, what you can see on the ambulance sheet is that the stretcher was brought into the residence. The patient was getting ready for transfer uh, from the chair to the stretcher when he started posturing and having a seizure. Uh, and then the patient was transport, transported into the ambulance unit. And um, once inside the unit, the patient went into the rhythm that's shown here. This is ventricular fibrillation or cardiac arrest. The patient was resuscitated out of that heart rhythm into the rhythm at the bottom, which shows evidence of an acute heart attack involving one of the three coronary arteries. So this EKG suggests that one of the three arteries is completely blocked. Um, and um, but the patient got taken to the hospital. Uh, there was a, a coronary angiogram done. Um, the artery that was blocked is called, was called the right coronary artery. That blockage was opened with a stent. Um, and so the patient got treated for the heart attack, but unfortunately uh, suffered a significant anoxic brain injury during the resuscitation in the ambulance and prior to that at home and expired about 10 days into the hospital course based on anoxic brain injury. So we have a, an individual who suffered a fatal heart attack. Now heart attack is in the medical term is myocardial infarction or abbreviated MI. So throughout the talk, I'll in, you know, interchangeably use heart attack, MI, um, uh, you know, and, and, and they mean the same thing. So this is the patient's um, uh, risk factors for heart attack you know, at a visit to the primary care doctor six months prior to his death. And what you have broken down the risk factors into lipid risk factors at the top and the non-lipid risk factor at the bottom. Uh, the non-lipid risk factors are absent. Uh, the lipid risk factors, the LDL cholesterol is 167. That's a little higher than average. Average in the US is 130. The HDL cholesterol is low. The triglycerides is 170, which is higher than normal, uh, which is labeled uh, 150 or lower is considered normal. Um, so he has a couple of lipid risk factors. Um, on the right is probably the most notable thing in the family is a strong family history of heart attack. So the patient here is with the black arrowhead. Um, the fa father had a heart attack at 51, uncle had a heart attack and died of a heart attack at 42 as well. Uh, and then uh, paternal grandmother also had her early heart attack. So there's a very strong familial clustering of heart attack. And, and when you see this kind of familiar clustering, immediately people think about genetics, the genes. This must be something in the genes. So here's a cartoon of people, the genome or DNA. And the average, uh, average in the population, the average person has average heart attack risk, okay? But um, some people may carry a genetic factor um, and that genetic factor may increase risk of disease. So like this, this patient, was there something in the genome that contributed to the higher risk? Now, on the flip side, some people actually carry a DNA change, a DNA letter change, a mutation that actually lowers risk, confers resistance to heart attack. So these are the two questions that I addressed over the years um, in my research lab prior to coming over to Verve. What is the genetic basis for risk and what's the genetic basis for resistance? So the disease um, that we're studying is called um, coronary heart disease, so yet, that's yet another term, heart attack, myocardial infarction, coronary heart disease. Coronary heart disease refers to those blockages in the, in the heart arteries. And this disease of a heart attack is, it really involves two phases. Shown here is the heart. The heart arteries run on the surface of the heart. And here's a little picture here of one of those arteries sliced open, essentially. And you see the flowing blood, and there's there's a, the wall of the artery. What happens over several decades is there's buildup of cholesterol and plaque in the heart artery wall. That's this yellow gunk here. And that's called coronary heart disease. That takes several decades. And then at a given time point, there can be a blood clot, this little really red stuff that forms within the center of the artery. And, and, and that blood clot can completely block blood flow. If it does completely block blood flow for more than about 20 minutes, then the heart muscle that is served by that artery can die. That death of heart tissue is called a heart attack or myocardial infarction, okay? 
And that depth of heart tissue can be detected by symptoms. The patient will typically feel chest pain, characteristic changes on the surface, EKG, or blood test abnormalities. Okay, so this is a disease that involves a long um, phase, a chronic phase, several decades of buildup of plaque in the heart arteries, and then an acute phase where there's a blood clot that forms at a given time point leading to the heart, heart attack. Now this disease has, is, is called a complex trait. What I mean by that is it, it has both a genetic component and livestock components. And we're all familiar with the livestock components for heart attack, including sedentary, um, lack of physical inactivity, smoking, and so forth. Now, half of all heart attacks, the first presentation is like this patient. There's actually a, it's a fatal event, okay? All right, the best understood risk factors for heart attack are shown here, and these are called lipoproteins. And so these are little spherical balls that carry either cholesterol, as shown in orange, or um, triglycerides, which is shown in blue, um, carry these two lipid substances in the bloodstream. So um, these, these are important uh, molecules that carry essentially energy, triglycerides and cholesterol, to different parts of the body. And this is the body's transport system for these substances that don't dissolve in water, uh, don't dissolve in blood. These lipids, I'm sure, you know, people, a lot of, I mean, millions of people have this measured every day when you get your LDL cholesterol checked or HDL cholesterol checked. This is, this is what I'm talking about. These lipoproteins are, are, are named based on the density. So this is HDL stands for high density lipoprotein. LDL stands for low density lipoprotein or they're named for the lipids they carry in the middle. These three are called triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, TRLs, because they carry mostly the blue stuff, the triglycerides. So these are risk factors for heart attack. Okay, so that's the background. So let's jump in to try to address those two questions I mentioned, which are what's the genetic basis for risk? What's the genetic basis for resistance? To look at the genetic basis for risk, we, uh, started recruiting patients at Mass General Hospital when I started training there in 1997. We enrolled patients into a research study who uh, had a heart attack at a young age. This is men less than 50 and women less than 60. And we wanted to study these patients, their genetics, their genome. Uh, and we chose young heart attack patients because um, it, DNA plays a larger role in disease when it happens at a young age. So we've defined two paths to heart attack risk, okay? One path is called the monogenic path. That means a single mutation in a gene, a single spelling change in the genome can put a person at risk. Mono being one, gene is you know, for genetic. In contrast, there's also a polygenic model, which means there's the additive effect of many spelling changes in the genome that can in aggregate lead to disease risk. These are the two paths that we've worked out over the last 15 years. And I'll just summarize the results of all this work. If you take 100 people with heart attack at a young age in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and you sequence their genome and ask how many of them carry a mono, you know, have this monogenic model, one spelling change that can cause increased risk. It turns out it's about two out of 100. 2% of early heart attack patients have a single spelling change in the genome that you can say is responsible for the early heart attack. And if you carry if, well, the people that carry this mutation, these mutations have about a 400% increase in risk or a fourfold increased risk. Okay, that's the monogenic model. Now, how do these mutations increase risk in these people? And they do so by elevating the blood level of cholesterol shown at the top or the blood triglyceride level. So these people have lifelong high cholesterol starting really at birth. And that's shown on the right on the, is the no mutation and yes mutation in a group of people. And on the Y axis is the LDL cholesterol. And you can see if you carry one of these monogenic mutations, they had an LDL cholesterol of 206, whereas those who didn't had an LDL cholesterol of 124. So that's, and the mechanism for how the mutation leads to heart attack, because it's essentially the cholesterol clogs up the arteries over, um, over years. Okay. Now, the, 
the monogenic model only explains a very small fraction of the early heart attack patients. The room, uh, uh, so we wondered what else is going on. So this is, uh, there's another model called the polygenic model that we've defined. And here, what happens is um, the risk comes from not one single spelling change, but really the additive effect of many, many, many changes across the genome. In fact, 6.6 million letters across the genome. If you, if you think about the, the genome, the DNA in your, in, your, in, your, in your body, in any given cell as a, as a book, that book has 3.2 billion letters. And that's the instruction code for life, okay? And, 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 and of those 3.2 billion letters, what we've been able to do is say, well, at these 6.6 .6 million spots in the genome, those spots contribute to heart attack risk. And we can take the information that comes from those spots and distill all that information into a single risk number for each person, so-called polygenic risk score. And then we can plot that score in the population. So each person gets a number, a risk score. And if you plot that score in the population, what you see is on the right. It's a beautiful bell curve. This is similar to if you plotted your cholesterol values in several hundred thousand people or blood pressure values in 700,000 people, you'll see this bell curve. So um, what this means is that everybody has a number and some people are high, some low, and many in the, in the middle. And what we're really wondering is if, you if you're high, how much higher risk are you for heart attack compared to the people in the middle? Okay, so what we showed was that if you're high polygenic risk, so let's say the top 5% of score in the population, they were at remarkably high risk, similar to the, um, the monogenic folks. So the high polygenic risk explained about 17 out of the 100 patients with early heart attack. And the people that got to, uh, people that had a polygenic high score, polygenic model was relevant, they had the same level of increased risk as the monogenic model. An important factor here is that the people who have high polygenic risk right now are not aware of their risk. This is not a test that's done regularly in, the pra in clinical practice right now. This idea of a calculating a polygenic risk score based on 6.6 .6 million letters across the genome, it's not, it hasn't yet become a clinical test and people are working on translating this research we did to a clinical test, but it's not quite ready yet. So how are these people that with a polygenic high score, how are they getting to risk? We don't quite know yet. It's a work in progress, but we can say it's not cholesterol. So what, by, what I, you can see on the right here, the people that have the high polygenic score versus everybody else, the LDL is 132 versus 124. It's a little higher in the high polygenic risk folks, but not so much higher that a doctor would notice. Okay, one question that comes up, so I've talked about two different models of increased heart attack risk. One is the monogenic model, one's a polygenic model. A question that we often get asked is, if you're high polygenic risk, if you happen to have like kind of lost the genetic lottery, um, is, are you doomed? Is DNA destiny? And it turns out, no, um, the risk for the risk that comes from polygenicity is modifiable. And it's modifiable by adhering to a healthy lifestyle and medications like cholesterol lowering statin medications. I'm gonna walk you through this lifestyle story because I think it's of general relevance um, and, and it shows the value of lifestyle in counterbalancing inherited risk. So the question we asked was, in individuals at high polygenic risk and a favorable lifestyle counterbalance that risk? So we generated a lifestyle score similar to the genetic score. And in this case, we only considered four factors, not 6.6 .6 million letters. And the four factors were very simple, under, I'm sure understandable to all of you. It's no smoking, a body mass index less than 30, regular physical activity and a healthy diet pattern. A person got one point for each of these four.
four things. So we labeled people who got three or four points, a favorable lifestyle, zero or one point, unfavorable lifestyle, and then two points intermediate, okay? And then we asked, if you're high genetic risk, how does that interact with the lifestyle? And that's shown on this chart. So this is a chart of only high polygenic risk folks on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the 10-year risk of a heart attack. And then I've broken the polygenic risk folks into three groups, red, gray, and blue. The red group is high polygenic risk and unfavorable lifestyle. And the blue group is high polygenic risk and favorable lifestyle. And what you can see is if you're high polygenic risk and unfavorable lifestyle, the 10 year risk of having a heart attack was like 11%, 10.7%. But if you're high polygenic risk and have a favorable lifestyle, the 10 year risk was only 5%. So it really shows the value of adherence to a favorable lifestyle to cut inherited risk for heart attack. Okay, so you, everybody, does have a, some amount of control over their own health when it comes to heart attack risk, even if you're dealt a bad hand in terms of genetics. Okay, so that's the risk portion. I'm gonna move on now to the, the, genet the genetic basis for resistance. The idea that if you have a spelling change in the genome, that that actually might help you. It might be a favorable thing. It might reduce your risk of a disease. Is that really true? Well, it is. It, there are now many examples. I'm going to sh give you examples from the heart disease, heart attack literature that we and others have worked on over the years. Here's, the, here's a good example of uh, 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 LDL cholesterol, so-called bad cholesterol. You've, I'm sure you've all had this measured, and the epidemiology suggests, shows that the higher the level of LDL cholesterol in the blood, it's correlated with increased risk of heart attack. Well, in, in about 15 years ago, a couple of groups found that some people carried a mutation in a gene called PCSK9, and that mutation turned off the gene. And as a result, these individuals had very low levels of LDL cholesterol lifelong and were remarkably protected against heart attack, suggesting that if you could develop a medicine that mimicked these natural mutations, natural resistance mutations, that, that would be good. And that's what drug companies did. They developed a, a treatment to block PCSK9 and then show that that treatment actually mimics the mutation that it actually can lower cholesterol and lower risk of heart attack. So here's a good example of a resistance mutation leading all the way to therapy. Now, um, that's what's shown here. Now, there is another uh, lipid I mentioned earlier called triglycerides, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, which again, the higher the level, higher risk of heart attack. And we, are the, we and others have shown that there are three different genes that all have the pattern of have mutations in the population that turn off any one of these genes. And those mutations lead to low levels of triglycerides and are associated with lower risk of heart attack. I'm going to walk you through one of these examples uh, to kind of illustrate how this whole approach of finding resistance mutations works. So here's a woman named Anna Fuhr, and um, she lived in St. Louis. She worked for the Purina um, dog food company. They had a corporate health fair where they measured blood cholesterol in people. And to Anna's surprise and the, the doctors at the company surprise, Anna's came back not with super high cholesterol, but look at the values, the triglycerides of 19, LDL of 37, HDL of 18, super low, vanishingly low levels. So they were surprised to see this and wondered why would her cholesterol be so low, okay? Now, a few years later, we worked with a doctor who had brought together the entire family, okay? So this is Anna's family. Anna is in this second row here and number labeled six, two, six. There's Anna, okay? She had nine brothers and sisters. Here are Anna's parents labeled one, seven, and eight, the grandparents, and then there's a generation below. 
So the people that are shaded, either half shaded or full shaded, are the people that had very low cholesterol levels in the family. This really looks like a single gene is responsible for the cholesterol values being low in the family. So-called a monogenic um, condition. So we worked with Dr. Schoenfeld from WashU St. Louis to try to figure out, hey, what's the gene here that's leading to the very low cholesterol? So we sequenced the genome of Anna and several of her siblings to figure this out back in 2010. And we did figure it out. This was the publication back then. These are some of the people that did the work in my laboratory. And it's a very fascinating story. So I'm coming back now to the family. Okay. So follow with me here. I mentioned Anna is two, six. And what happened was here's Anna's mother, one, seven. And now I've labeled half of, uh, half of Anna's mother with a blue uh, uh, shade. And that means that Anna's mother carried a mutation in this gene called ANGPTL3 that broke the gene. Now, if you remember from biology, all of us carry two copies of every gene, one inherited from our mother, one from the father. So Anna had one copy of the ANGPTL3 gene broken. Okay, that's the specific mutation S17X and had passed on that broken copy to one, two, three, four, five, six of her nine children. You see that? One, two, three, four, five, six, okay? Now what's remarkable is in this family, the father married in, right here, one, eight, married in, and we found that he carried a different mutation in the same gene, this E129X. And he passed that on to one, two, three, four, five of the nine children. And Anna inherited one broken copy of ANGPTL3 from her mother, the blue here, and one from the father, the orange. So she had both copies of this gene broken. She didn't have any ANGPTL3. She had none of this protein in the blood. So, and that was the cause of the very, very low lipid levels. So what this one single family teaches us is if you get rid of ANGPTL3, your cholesterol would be super low. And getting rid of ANGPTL3 is well tolerated. There's no problem. All these people are super healthy. So it's not an essential gene. It's not a gene that's needed. Okay. We went on to evaluate Anna further and looked at her heart arteries and they were whistle clean. They didn't even have any blockage. So that having that lipid at level low lifelong was good for her in terms of not leading to blockages. Then we went on to show that in the general population, a bunch of people actually do carry just one copy of the gene broken and they have lower LDL cholesterol and triglycerides lifelong and are protected against heart attack. So here's another story of a resistance mutation. So there's PCSK9 gene, the ANGPTL3 gene. In total, there are eight genes that have been discovered that have this pattern of resistance mutations being in them. And here are the eight genes, okay? So what I've tried to show you is that there's mutations that increase risk can lead to early heart attack. There are mutations that protect and can point the way to new medicines because they teach us that of the genes that can be gotten rid of essentially for health. Now, coming back to this patient, how can we use this kind of information to avoid such tragedies? There are two things we can, three things we can do. Two on the risk side. One is more routinely interpret the genome, read it and interpret it to identify those patients who are at risk for premature heart attack, either based on the monogenic model or the polygenic model. And then once you identify these at-risk individuals, deliver proven risk-reducing interventions like lifestyle treatment and or medicines. Okay, that's on the risk side. 
On the resistance side, I, I mentioned, we really want to develop new treatments that mimic resistance mutations. And the PCSK9 antibodies that I mentioned are one such treatment. But are there more treatments we can develop that, that mimic the resistance mutations? And that's where I'll close with the last portion of the talk, the last few minutes. So imagine if there was a one and done treatment that safely and permanently lowered blood LDL cholesterol and or triglycerides. This kind of treatment has the potential to eradicate heart disease, eradicate coronary heart disease. Now eradicate is a very strong term. How can I say that? Well, here are the chart that kind of points the way. These kind of studies that we and others have done really does reveal a solution to heart attack. The solution to heart attack really is lifelong level, low level of cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. And on the x-axis here is age. On the y-axis is a cumulative exposure a person has to cholesterol over their lifetime, okay? And there are three lines. Let's start with the average line. The average line cross, then there's also a, a, a bar up here, a gray bar. And that's the threshold above which of cumulative exposure one develops heart attack. So the average person you can see crosses that gray bar right around mid 60s. That turns out the average age of a heart attack in the US for a man, like mid 60s, 65, okay? But there are a group of people in purple who have high genetic risk, that's those monogenic mutation people that I mentioned where they have high cholesterol starting early in life and the disease is called familial hypercholesterolemia and they have cumulative exposure starting at birth much higher levels and can have a heart attack in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, kind of like this patient, the patient I presented in the beginning. On the flip side are those resistance mutation patients, like uh, people like Anna Fuhrer, who have on blue, who have low cholesterol lifelong, naturally, and they never get a heart attack. You can see that the blue line never crosses that threshold. So what this kind of natural genetics experiment experiment of nature teaches us is that if you could get all of our cholesterols to look like Anna Fuhrer's, we would all never develop a heart attack. We would die of something else. So what can we do to, to really lead to permanent lowering of cholesterol? Well, that's where um, Verve, the company that I founded, comes in. And we're leveraging a technology that became available in 2012, uh, discovered in 2012, called CRISPR. I'm sure some of you have heard of this. And this is a technology that allows you to rewrite the genome. Okay. The rewrite the letters in that book that I mentioned, in the book of 3.2 billion letters. And we're looking to use that tool to, in the fight against cardiovascular disease. What we wanna do is develop what's called a gene editing medicine that mimics these resistance mutations that really can turn off a LDL raising gene in the liver in adults to, to permanently lower cholesterol and to treat, to treat heart, heart, heart attack. So this is the team that I've built. We built, it's about 45 people now. We're based in Cambridge, Mass. We're a, a biotech company. And what we're doing is using two tools, gene editing technologies. On the left is so-called CRISPR. This is a system that is, you know, analogy is a molecular scissors. It cuts DNA and therefore can turn off a gene. Very specifically, just one spot in the genome. On the right is called base editing. This is kind of a cousin or a version 2.0 of CRISPR. And here it doesn't cut DNA, but actually it's like a pencil and eraser. That's that picture on the right here. Literally what you're doing is going in and at one spot of the 3.2 billion letters, you can say, well, here's an A here. I'm gonna change that A to a G just at that spot and use that to turn off a gene. So these are the tools that we assembled. And what we've been able to do is use these tools to show 
that they can be they can they can be they can turn off a gene in the liver in an animal. So here's an experiment in mouse, and we delivered intravenously to the mouse our gene editing medicine. The gene editing medicine goes, makes its way from the bloodstream to the liver, and then turns off a gene. And on the right here, at the top right, you can see the effect of that. Here, the cloudy plasma, cloudy blood plasma from the mouse is cloudy because the cholesterol is super high in that mouse. But after coming in with our gene editing treatment to turn off a gene and lower the cholesterol, the plasma completely clears up. Okay, so this is a proof of concept in mouse that this approach can work. Now, we do have cholesterol lowering medications right now, and some of you may be taking it, which is a statin medication to lower cholesterol, but it's a daily pill that you take for the rest of your life. This approach is a one and done. One-time treatment, permanent lowering of cholesterol, never have to take a pill again. So that was work that we got it to work in mice. What about in other animals? So here's data in monkeys, um, which are much closer to humans. And if it works in monkeys, much, much more likely to work in people. So recently at the end of June, the company released data where we tested this approach in monkeys. And we had two different um, uh, drugs, uh, one drug at the top that, that turns off a gene called PCSK9, one drug at the bottom that turns off a gene called ANGPTL3, again, using this gene editing approach. And what we did was we, we measured blood in the monkeys prior to giving our treatment, then we gave the treatment at time zero. And then at two weeks, we figured out how much of the editing we got, how much of that single spelling change we were able to make in the liver and by assessing the DNA. Then we also measured the blood protein level that's made by the gene and then the blood cholesterol level to see were we able to turn off the gene and did that turning off the gene lead to lower cholesterol or lower triglycerides? And here are the answers. Um, the, for the first drug that targets PCSK9, this gene PCSK9, we were able to get the spelling change made in nearly every liver cell. Okay, and that's really literally, we're erasing an A and putting in a G in every liver cell in a living animal. Adult animal. And as a result of that, we got a 90% lowering of cholesterol in this study two, second study here in the middle. I'm oh, sorry, 90% lowering of the blood protein, PCS kind of protein, and then a 60% lowering of LDL cholesterol minus 59% here. So we were able to turn off the gene in the monkey, lower the protein level and lower the cholesterol level. Similarly for ANGPTL3, we were able to get that spelling change made that we wanted in every, nearly every liver cell. This led to a 95% reduction in plasma protein, ANGPTL3 protein, and then a 65% in blood triglycerides. So what we've been able to do is go from proof of concept or vision, sorry, of a one and done treatment to lower cholesterol permanently to proof of concept in non-human primates. Now this is a short-term study in the monkeys, only two weeks. <clears throat> we are following the monkeys out over time and, and that will tell us how durable this effect is, but we expect it to be actually quite durable lifelong. So where are we headed now? Um, Verve, we are, by the end of the year, we'll pick a specific product that we want to take into patients, specific drug that we want to take into patients. We call that a lead candidate. That will kick off roughly a year and a half of additional studies to prove the safety in, uh, in animal models. And then we, we're looking forward to initiating treatment in patients, experimental trials in patients in first in human studies in, in about two to three years. So let me stop there um, in terms of um, what I've tried to cover is why do some people develop heart attack at a young age? 
why are some people naturally protected against heart attack? And can we use the resistance mutations to inspire the development of new medicines? And I'm, I try to show you that Verb is developing a gene editing medicine based on the resistance mutations and we are the, that we and others have identified. Thank you. Well, it looks like we have um, one question that um, somebody sent in through chat and uh, let me go back to that here. At what age would medical intervention be ideal? For cholesterol lowering, turns out the earlier the better. Um, because the it's actually a problem of cumulative exposure over a lifetime. And so typically now we start cholesterol lowering after somebody's had a heart attack when they're like 65. And that's well after the horse is out of the barn. Now it's still effective. You know, when you start treatment at 65 it, with cholesterol lowering medication, it's very effective in reducing the risk of another heart attack. But to prevent a first heart attack, you'd want to start even earlier. Um, so earlier the better, it really is, is the, I think for, for cholesterol lowering. Now for lifestyle, it's the same. You know, those lifestyle habits that I mentioned, it, this is a chronic disease. And so those habits get formed early in life, the bad habits or the good habits. And they have a lot of consequences. And if you can get to the good lifestyle habits early in life, you're much less likely to become obese, become, uh, you know, have high cholesterol, um, have high blood pressure, all these things that can increase your risk of having a heart attack. One of the other questions um, was, could you envision this being given to children with that high genetic risk? And how do you go about making testing for those markers early, early enough on. Yeah, so I think that um, there are two separate questions, I would say. It is good, it is possible to identify kids at risk based on checking the cholesterol, you know, just a blood test. You don't need to do a genetic test. And, if, and, and the kids that have a genetic disease of familial hypercholesterolemia well, that'll show up as high cholesterol starting early in life in the blood in their in their blood. So that's pro that's the most common common way to identify these at risk individuals for the monogenic. Um, in terms of our gene editing therapy, we are exclusively focused on adults, people who can give consent for this kind of therapy. The uh, verb is and gene editing is a new tool, new new tool in the toolbox, a new approach to disease, um, and uh, and so therefore we want to, um, we want to um, focus our attention on adults, again, who can give permission for this kind of new treatment. Yeah, there was a follow-up question. Um, if you have a strong family history of heart disease, how do you go about getting this testing after the trial? Yeah, so... Um, I think, uh, I'm, I think you're referring to the, the, the genetic tests that I mentioned, um, either for the monogenic or the polygenic model. If you have a strong family history, um, can you get this kind of testing done to uh, see? And um, yes, you can. Um, there are, you, for the monogenic model, where you, a single mutation is in a couple of genes, any of a couple of genes can lead to high cholesterol, um, there are uh, established tests where sequencing is done with your DNA that they take from blood. For the polygenic model, I mentioned that the test is not quite ready, although um, there are a couple of groups now offering, including one at Mass General Hospital where I work, um, for this polygenic score on a trial basis. And so I think it'll be a matter of time, only be a matter of time before it becomes more widely available. But, but there are places to get, get the test if you have a strong family history. Um, there was another question about um, a family history of 
atrial fibrillation, um, that there's been two or three generations in the family that have had it. And do, do these tests, do they indicate that kind of a genetic component? That's I'm a not great sure question. how to yeah, ask the question. So, atrial, that's a great question. Atrial fibrillation is based on an entirely different disease from what we were talking about today. So heart disease is a very general term. Under the umbrella of heart disease, there are different parts of the heart that can go awry, right? Coronary heart disease or heart attack or myocardial infarction is a problem of the artery. It's a plumbing problem. The plumbing gets clogged, okay? In contrast, atrial fibrillation is a problem of the heart wiring. It's an electrical problem. You know, the heart is an electrical organ. It actually beats spontaneously, continuously for one's whole life. And that's based on electrical impulses that are carried every minute or every, uh, sorry, um, 60 times a minute um, that, um, that, that, that make the heart beat. Atrial fibrillation is a problem of that electrical wiring. Now, normally, atrial fibrillation um, can have a lifestyle component, but it can also have a genetic component. It, like this family, it sounds like this uh, multiple generations. And people have done research similar to the research that we did for heart attack, very similar research for atrial fibrillation. And the genetic basis for atrial fibrillation has been decoded as well. And you can get this kind of test the, particularly the polygenic test for atrial fibrillation as well. Wow. Um, is there any risk um, in turning a portion of a gene off or is each portion of a gene specific for only that one function? Great question. The, um, the things that you have to think about when you try to turn a gene off and, and what we're trying to do, which is be expected to be a permanent turning off is you want to make sure that is that it's safe you know and there are a couple of reasons so you have to pick that gene that you want to turn off very carefully there are several reasons to think that turning off a gene like pcsk9 is safe one is there are humans walking around who don't have the gene at all and are completely healthy Kind of like Anna had that gene A and GPTL3 completely turned off and she is fine. Similarly, there are people walking around with that other gene, PCSK9. So one way to, to show that the, turning off the gene is okay is to find humans who naturally have it gone and look at them and make sure they're healthy. And that's been the case for a couple of these, these genes. The second way is you can develop a medicine against the gene, give it to patients, and, and see, if does it, it's going to do some good, lowering the cholesterol, but is there any bad things that happen in the patients in the, in the, with the medicine? And it turns out, like for PCSK9, there have been drugs. I mentioned the, 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 what's called a monoclonal antibody, a drug that blocks PCSK9. That was developed about 10 years ago and has now been treated and now been tested in trials, many, many thousands of people. And the drug works beautifully to lower cholesterol and lower risk of heart attack and doesn't have any side effects. So those are the kind of, uh, and then the lastly would be uh, is animal models. So you can test turning off the gene in mice or monkeys and see if anything bad happens. And all of those lines of evidence line up to suggest that turning off PCSK9 or ANGPTL3 is going to be well tolerated and no problems. All right, there's a couple more questions that came up here. Um, let's see. Do you hypothesize side effects with this treatment or similar to the patient Anna um, with a healthy or clean profile? And then how invasive is, is this procedure? Great question. So I think we anticipate that turning off a gene like ANGPTL3 would lead to no side effects and just benefit. But we have to prove that. Um, 
And wow. the way why we think that is because of Anna. You know, she's out there, not doesn't have any PCSK9, has several, several, several of her brothers and sisters are the same. They don't have any PCSK9 in that family and they're fine. There are hundreds of people like this that have been found around the world now um, that completely lack the gene and are fine. Okay, so that gives us confidence that what we're going to do is going to lead to health, but no, ben, no uh, problems, um, but no uh, adverse problems. Now, how invasive procedure? Well, it turns out it's just a, uh, it, it, it's just a intravenous infusion. So it's just an IV. You get hooked up to an IV for 60 minutes, and the drug gets dripped in during those 60 minutes. So it's not really even a procedure. It's just really, literally, a 60-minute drip into your to your bloodstream. I was curious um, where you, you you mentioned you know that the the drug impacted the liver and changed the alphabet in the DNA in the liver. I mean, does it change the DNA everywhere else in the body as well, or is it just the liver? And how do you target it in just that one <laughs> organ? That's that's, that's wild. Great, that's a great question. Yeah. So. Um, it turns out that the way we deliver this, okay, is we, the, the drug um, is uh, covered up in a little lipid ball called the lipid nanoparticle. And that's that, so that's what's infused in, okay? Those lipid nanoparticles are very, very, um, uh, have, a, have, a, have an attraction to the liver, almost exclusively go to the liver after you infuse in, into the bloodstream. By the way, anything you infuse into the bloodstream, the first place it goes into the liver. The liver is like the garbage dump for the body. It's the detoxifying kind of you know, organ. So these lipid nanoparticles go there and they almost all get taken up. There is some lipid nanoparticle and drug delivered to other parts of the body as well, but much, much less than the liver. So this is one of the things where we have to check in our checking is are we getting that spelling change only in liver cells or are we getting in other cells in the body as well? It turns out we're almost exclusively getting the change only in liver cells. Is a, there are some um, changes, some small fraction of cells in the spleen, one or two other organs that get changed, but much, much lower as a percentage compared to liver cells. So it is wild. I think that if you told me eight years ago that we had a pencil and eraser approach to at will change a letter in an entire organ, I would have said no way in hell. Hmm. But, but that's what's possible now. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, let's see, we have a couple more questions. Um, does the gene do anything beneficial for the good cholesterol or is that a different gene, or do you not need the good cholesterol? That's a great question. So this is a part of the talk that I kind of took out uh, because of time constraints, but we've done a lot of work on so-called good cholesterol, called HDL cholesterol. And um, it turns out that um, if you have high levels of good cholesterol, you are, at lower you are at lower risk for heart attack. So high levels are correlated with lower risk. But that does not seem to be a cause and effect relationship. What I mean by that is it's simply a correlation in the population. If you have high HDL, the so-called good cholesterol, you are at lower risk, but it's not because of the HDL. How do I know that? Well, we've done some work and in human genetics and basically found people who carried mutations that naturally raise their HDL cholesterol lifelong. Now, if, and those should be protective mutations. Those should be like these resistance mutations. So we asked whether those people that carry these mutations that raise their HDL lifelong, are they protected from heart attack compared to those who don't carry the mutations? If HDL was truly protective and causally protective, then the people who carry HDL mutations, um, raising mutations lifelong, should have lower risk for heart attack. What we found was that these individuals who carried HDL raising mutations had the same risk for heart attack as those who didn't carry the mutations. 
And so this really strongly suggested that there was not likely to be a cause and effect relationship between HDL and heart attack and led to the hypothesis or, or, or predicted that medicines designed exclusively to raise HDL cholesterol would not work. They wouldn't lower risk of heart attack. So we made that prediction in 2012. And shortly thereafter, there were some trials reported of medicines designed to raise HDL cholesterol exclusively. And wouldn't you know it, they didn't work. The medicines raised the HDL cholesterol by a lot, but they didn't lower risk of heart attack. So where we are now in terms of HDL is that it's a marker of risk, you know, but it's not a causal factor. Well, this, this has been really, really informative and I, I, I so appreciate you're spending this amount of time with us. I know you're, you're extremely busy traveling the world, got a, a lot of, um, you know, people interested in, in everything that you're doing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I want to, again, say thank you for spending your time and sharing your knowledge with us. I think people are curious and are going to follow things. And I really hope that you have found, you know, a way to cure heart disease and save millions of lives every year. Um, that would be a fantastic achievement, you know, by any thank measure. You. Thank you so yeah. much for the invitation and, uh, and appreciate it. Stay safe. All right. Thank you so much. Have bye -bye. a good evening. Yep. Okay. Bye. Yep.